Hi, I'm Greg Heibel. I'm a partner in the Emerging Companies Group at Oric, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Gary Swart, CEO of Odesk. He's joining me for five questions. So, Gary, what is the key ingredient that an entrepreneur requires to be truly successful? Oh, geez. Uh, and it's got to be one key ingredient. The one. <laughs> the one. You know, I think there's this um, sort of like this unwavering, uh, sort of commitment to your idea. You have this passion around this thing, and it's that passion that has to enable you to not ride the roller coaster, right? So you've got to have this belief that this is this is really going to go. And I think the absence of that, uh, so many people would give up, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, a good friend of mine started a little company, and he said they pitched 35 investors before they were able to secure funding in their B round. And he said they were getting laughed out of, uh, laughed out of, of VC firms on Sand Hill Road. And you know, that little company was Netflix, right? And so you know, you're gonna do what? You're gonna put DVDs in an envelope? What are you talking about? And so I just think you have to have this passion uh, for what it is and this commitment to, to see it through, so. Do you ever lose it? This is not your. This is not your first go at. at, yeah, at not my start. first rodeo. Yeah, you know it's hard. I, the advice I give to new entrepreneurs is try not to ride the roller coaster, because there's going to be highs and lows. I mean, you know, our business has been around for a while. We're arguably seeing some pretty good success now, but there's still the opportunity to get on that roller coaster. And the problem is, is if you ride it, one, you'll sleep less at night, <laughs> which is bad. But I think worse is that your team. Any little motion that you make is magnified for your team. And if your team sees you riding the roller coaster, it's amazing how distracting or disruptive that can be to your culture and you to your sneeze, environment. You sneeze, they get the flu. Exactly. And so you have to watch uh, your behavior and try and, um, and, try and keep you know, an even keel because you know, otherwise the boat can be, uh, you know. Uh, what do you tell yourself in those dark nights when, when maybe you're starting to question what's going on, what do you tell yourself to get you back as a center and square? You know, I think it's exactly that. It's you have to sort of center and square yourself and say, okay, what's the logical approach here? Let's get, you know, there's sort of this emotional self and logical self, and in the middle of that is where you have to try and be. And so I think it's just really focusing on the logical self and saying, okay, you know, how bad is this really, right? And is it reversible or irreversible? And how bad is it? And, you know, kind of talk yourself off the ledge. And, you know, of course, having good sounding boards there is helpful. Yeah, I was going to ask, is it, is it okay for a CEO to confide in somebody, to, to be that? Who, who, do you, who, do you, who does the CEO go to when, when they need to be pumped up a little bit? Well, I think it's really, really not only okay, but it's, it's necessary and it's important. And I think you have to have a, 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 a group of you know, advisors or network. And these don't have to be paid people. These can be other CEOs or friends or people you respect. In my case, it was a former boss who I would call and say, hey, John, what would you do? You know, and he was really good at the logical self. He had skills that I didn't have. He would often say, I was really good at smelling smoke and getting from point A to point B with the solution. But he would want to know where that smoke was coming from. Right? And so he would diagnose the problem exceptionally well before taking action. And so uh, John has skills I don't have in this regard, and he was always a great person to go to to say, hey, what would you do in this situation? And before he'd answer, he'd say, well, let's talk for a half an hour and let me understand it better. And that's just really fantastic. You joined us for a great panel we had recently on how to work with your board of directors. Should your board be that sounding board, or are they your boss? And so is it a different role? No, I think they they could and should be. I think the more uh, tuned in they are with your company and uh, and with what's going on, it, that, that's not a bad thing. And they, of course, uh, you, you know, I, I've surrounded myself with great board members who I think of. They're all operators. They've been in businesses before, and so I really value their opinion. And again, I think they have skills and wisdom gained from all of their their activities that can be really valuable. So I think that's good. Now, I would catch that by saying it shouldn't be very tactical things, right? right. That, that could, uh, I don't think that's productive for you or for them. Right. What's the one thing you wish you had done differently with your companies? Well, uh, for starters, I wish I had started something like Instagram. <laughs> that would have been great, you know, like nine months and sell it to, <laughs> sell it to Facebook. But, uh, um, you I know, I bought the winning lottery ticket. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there you go. Oh, that wasn't that wasn't what you were looking for. Oh. <laughs> um, my last company was a little company called IntelliBank, and we had this brilliant concept to share documents via the cloud, a little bit like. Uh, 
Dropbox <laughs> and we didn't execute. We were arguably, you could say we were too early, but I, I really think it's not that we were too early, it's just that we didn't execute. We didn't call the right plays. We didn't pick the right strategy. And I think the thing that we got wrong is when we were going after the wrong target market. And as a result, we didn't focus. And so I know this sounds like a lot of things, but I would say my guidance would be to focus on one thing <laughs> that you do really, really well and nail that, and then of course expand from there and not try and be all things to all people. And that focus really helps you to to determine product market fit. Mm -hmm. Because you more quickly determine whether or not you have a market for that thing and you can pivot more quickly as opposed to deluding yourself into thinking that you have a market right. by having seven markets you know, and trying to do all things for all people. So I think it's focusing on uh, as narrow a slice as you can to, to validate product market fit. But it's okay to pivot. Uh, it's more than okay to pivot. I think the sooner you can figure out whether or not you have a market for something, the sooner you pivot, right? And I think some of the very, uh, the very best entrepreneurs and companies have done that, right? They, I, I, you know, I look at um, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz at their company, and they, they started in, you know, web hosting or, you know, data center business, and look where they ended up, and Opsware selling to, uh, ultimately, to HP. I mean, yeah. that's just amazing um, ability to navigate the whitewater and get, come out in a great place. It's brilliant. As you've started companies and run companies and been successful at companies, which was more important, the team or the technology? Oh, you know, both are so important. But I, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go with team. I think that you know, let's look at what you need for a successful company. First, you need a big market, right? Uh, the second thing you need is the money to execute on that market, and then the third thing is you need is the right strategy. And I think you improve your chances on two and three by having the right team in place. It doesn't do us any good if you, know, you and I are on a sports team and I say, look, you go in the end zone and I'll throw you the ball. That only works if you can run and I can throw and you can catch, right? And so I think you need the right people on the team. They help to call the right strategy and then, of course, to execute on it. So I think you improve your odds. And then, of course, you, you get faster to a pivot if, yeah. if you don't have the, uh, the big market or the, or, the, or the right strategy. So I'll go with, uh, with good team every time. Now, with that said, I think it's important that you surround yourself with people that have skills that complement yours, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to find everybody that looks and acts and thinks like you is yeah. not, not the winning strategy there. You've obviously done a lot of pitching to investors. You've been very successful raising money. Uh, what, are, what are the three most important things that an entrepreneur should keep in mind when they're, when they're looking for money, when they're pitching to investors? Yeah, it's so funny you say that. You know, I've had a lot of experience pitching to investors. Um, the experience you get when you don't get all the other things you want. And I got a lot of experience that in Telemac, <laughs> we were trying to pitch and we, we didn't get funding, right? I mean, we probably had 20 meetings up and down Sand Hill Road and um, it didn't come out successfully right. from that process. And let me think of some of the mistakes we made there. One is I don't think our story was crisp, right? We were trying to put too much in the window. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, I'd be really crisp about, you know, what problem are you trying to solve and how are you doing differently and why your team is in the best position to do that. Uh, the second thing is having the right people in the room with you. I've been in uh, situations where I felt it was good to have more people in the room, even one or two more, and that wasn't the right, uh, the right call. Um, we did not get funding at one point because I had the wrong person in the room. And it wasn't that, um, you know, that person was junior. Uh, it, we kind of talked over each other. And what the feedback I got afterwards was, one, is that the best team you can hire? And two, these guys clearly don't work well together. They're not in sync if one is talking over the other, right? And so I think it was a function of who we had in the room uh, contributed to the, to the lack of funding there. So don't put too much in the window. Have the right people in the room. And, uh, you know, I think it's recognize the audience, right? So who are you pitching to? And, and I think it's hard to pitch if you don't know how they're buying and what's important to them. Uh, some VCs want... Um, you know, more PowerPoint, others want more Excel, and I think it's just um, recognizing who your audience is and making sure that you're uh, appropriately given the story. And how do you find that out? 
who do you who do you ask to figure out whether this is a PowerPoint audience or if this is a a, a tell a story audience? Well, I think you can you know typically if you're pitching to VCs, you're going to have a, a sponsor or a, a champion or you know a focus of receptivity at that firm who's who's bringing you in and. And then I think, you know, what other investments have they made, do you, you know, in, in this uh, connected and open and transparent world, you can find somebody who is already funded by them or mm-hmm. pitched them and didn't succeed, but trying to get that data in advance, I think is important. How important is your gut to you on a daily basis? Do you have a certain spidey sense that starts to tingle when, when things are going strange? Well, I think it's really important. I think, um, you know, I've been told that I've been pretty perceptive, but I think it can be dangerous. You know, like you trust your gut so much around, uh, I don't know, the website should look like this and the data says something else, you know. And so I like to say, look, in the absence of data, we're going to trust somebody's opinion. It's mine, but let's bring me the data. And I think, you know, nowadays everything is becoming so data-driven that I just love testing it, you know? And uh, there's been times where my gut has been 180 degrees wrong, right? I thought this would perform better and this completely outperformed it. So I'm a big fan of testing and measuring. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the spirit of, um, I learned something once, it's uh, in in making decisions, you know, is it reversible or irreversible? Mm -hmm. Well, if it's reversible, make a fast decision because more at bats is better than, you know, you'd rather make a decision and either succeed or fail than have no decision and right. succeed or fail. So I'm a big fan of more decisions, and if that means trusting your gut, especially in a reversible decision, decision then, then I say uh, go for it. More swings of the bat is a good thing. Just don't repeat your mistakes, right? Never waste a good, uh, good failure, a good crisis, and yeah. learn from it and move on. The bonus question. What is your favorite beverage? Oh, geez, favorite beverage. Well, I'm not a um, I'm not a drinker since the incident. I haven't. Uh, there was no incident. <laughs> getting, make some great great footage. People have just woke up. Um, I like ice. Stay tuned. Tea. Yeah, yeah. Join us for next month. Version two, I think, uh, goes viral. Right now, I'm a big uh, I'm a big Arnold Palmer fan. Big fan of the iced tea lemonade. And uh, I, why is that my favorite beverage? I don't even know. Uh, it's lemony. It's delicious. Yeah. You know, when you're an on-the-go housewife like me, it's just the pick-me-up I need. So, yeah, it's the, uh, the Arnold Palmer is All the right. beverage of choice. Gary Swart, thank you very much. Thanks, Appreciate Greg. It. Pleasure.